Okay, in today's lecture we're going to talk about a number of different things. First of all we're going to talk a little bit more about variables and in particular we're going to talk about how scoping of variables work in the Java language. So it's important to understand how scoping works because uh, it can create some, it often causes confusion for beginning programmers and if you're not careful with how things are scoped you can also get yourself into some trouble and uh, your programs may not be doing exactly what you, you think they should be doing. We're going to talk a little bit more about arrays. Uh, make sure arrays are such an important part of a programming language. We'll talk more about how single dimensional arrays work and I'll also show you how you can declare multi-dimensional arrays. So this would be something like a two-dimensional array. So if you wanted to represent something like the positions of a bunch of um, uh, checkers on a checkerboard, maybe you have a two-dimensional array where each position of the array denotes a game position and whether there's a, a white or a red piece in that position on the board. And we're also going to talk a lot today about debugging. I'm sure you've probably got yourself into a, a, a few problems in your first programs. And so programming is, is um, you know, it can be difficult. You make little mistakes and those mistakes can be hard to find. I'm going to give you some tips and tricks that will hopefully allow you to, first of all, try and avoid making mistakes in the first place. And second of all, once the program is doing something, you know, you don't know what's going on, how do you figure out what's wrong and how do you fix it? So the first topic, variable scoping. It's important to remember that whenever you declare a variable, and by declare, whenever you declare a variable is when you put a, a type before the variable name. Uh, in this example here, we've got a main program. We're declaring the variable x on this first line of the main. All right, and I can tell this is a declaration because I've got this int data type before the variable name. Whenever you put the primitive type in front of it, that's a declaration. Variables only live within the curly, curly brace block in which they're declared. In this case, x was declared in the curly brace block that encompasses the entire main program. So in this program, you can use x anywhere in the program. You can use it once it's been declared. I can use it in the for loop, and I can use it after the for loop. However, this variable y here, it's declared in the initialization portion of the for loop. And if you recall from the lecture on loops, this if you initialize, if you declare a variable here by putting the data type in front of it, that variable is only accessible inside the curly curly braces of that for loop. This program in fact won't actually won't actually compile because the variable y is unknown once you're out of that for loop. It has no uh, sensible value outside of this and Java knows it and it won't let the program compile. How could we fix this? Well we could fix this by declaring it after the the for loop, set it equal to 1. This program will now compile and it doesn't do anything particularly sensible, right? Multiplying x by 1 isn't really going to change change the value of x, but this program will now compile. And this is a demonstration of reusing the same variable name. Inside this for loop, we've got a variable and it's called y. But once we exit the for loop, this y that was in the for loop ceases to exist. And because it ceases to exist, we are, we're free to reuse that variable name and assign it whatever value we like. This would not be allowed, I could not take this line int y equals 1 and put it inside the for loop because then I would have two variables named y and, and Java would be confused. Once a variable is out of scope, it's fair game to be declared again. Now to arrays. Now recall arrays store a bunch of values all of the same type and we saw different ways you can declare and create arrays. You can declare them in a single line. For example, this line right here, we're saying I've got a variable, I want to call it x. It's it holds integers and it's an array. That's the square empty square brackets and this the right side of that is actually creating the array 
and uh, initializing, you know, preparing 10 slots in the array to put things in. If we want to store something different, like floating point values, we can change the type to double. All right, you remember you got to match both sides. And if you wanted to store strings, you could change the data type to string. Whenever you want to pull out a value, you've got to use the variable name, square brackets, and then an integer index. Either you need to use an actual literal number, number like putting in a 0 or a 1, or a 99 or a 98, all right? or as we'll see uh, in, a, in, a, in the next slide, you can actually use a, a variable index. Remember, array indexes must start at 0. Speed 99 is okay. Speed 100 is not okay. Uh, zero counts as one of the positions, so the valid indices of sp the speed array are zero, bracket zero, bracket one, through bracket 99. You can just declare an array. Here is an example of just declaring an array called x that can hold integers but at this point we haven't created the array there is no memory associated with that variable there are no slots in which to put values if you try and do that it's not going to work you can split it up and do it in two lines you can declare and then create it in a separate line if you like all right and you can kind of think of an array as a tray of cups if I declared an integer array and created it with seven slots. I essentially have seven cups and each cup can hold a integer value. Each, what's in this, you know, once I create this thing x and say it's equal to new int bracket seven, what's actually inside those cups? Well, Java is going to initialize each of the cups to a default value and in the case of an integer that default value is going to be zero. Um, This variable x just refers to the tray of cups. And in itself, it's not usually useful for too much. Um, we'll see, see some uses for uh, just the variable x, x later. The main thing you could do with the variable x is call x.length. And this gets, gets the, um, the length of that array. If you're not sure how many things are in it, you can call x.length. And in this case, if you called x.length, it will return 7 because there are seven available slots, zero through six. If you try and go outside zero through six, it's gonna fail. No fair going to negative one, no fair going to seven. If you do do this, and you, you're bound to do this sooner or later if you use arrays, you'll see there's, you'll get an array index out of bounds exception. And it when it prints out the exception, it will actually give you the index you used and the name of the array I think um, and you can track down what's going wrong with your code and as I mentioned uh, it wasn't exactly the next slide was it but uh, it was a number of slides later you can use a variable in this bracket notation you don't always have to put a literal number you can put a, a variable that variable had better be of um, an integer type however there's no fair putting a string or a double value inside of the square brackets. It must be an integer, and you must make sure it is within the range 0 to the length minus 1, inclusive of 0 and inclusive of x dot length minus 1. So that's a review of single dimensional arrays. I wanted to show you something a little new two-dimensional arrays. You can imagine sometimes your data has, um, you know, might be better represented by, say, a matrix, or uh, you could think of it like a spreadsheet with rows and columns. For example, I'm going to show you an example of, imagine you recorded the hourly temperatures, all right? Every day you record 24 samples of whatever the temperature is, and you record that for a week. So you've got seven days with 24 data points in each day. And other examples of things you might use a 2D array for would be something like visualizing the, you know, this is a, this image here is a visualization of 
the charge between uh, the, or the potential between a bunch of charged particles. Uh, we'll look at how to do the graphics in, in a future lecture. Or as I mentioned in uh, the introduction, maybe you have a checkers game and you want to store in your, your 2D array what type of piece is at every location in, in the game. Here's an example of the temperature thing. Each row in this, this spreadsheet is a particular day. So for example, maybe the first row is Sunday, the second row is Monday, and then Tuesday, and, and so on. And this first reading was recorded at midnight, and then 1 a.m. and 2 a.m., all right, all the way back up to uh, 11 p.m. That's the data. All right, and so a particular row is a particular date, and then, as I said, a particular column is a particular time. How do we do that, and how do we make a two-dimensional array? We could, you could imagine just storing, having all this data in a single one-dimensional array, and then trying to figure out, based on the day of the week and the hour, which position it was in. So you could have 24 times 7 positions in your single dimensional array, but that would be kind of hard to keep track of. Here is how you can do a two dimensional array. It's pretty similar to a one dimensional array, but there's an extra set of square brackets. If we have a two dimensional array called A, it's going to have two empty square brackets in the declaration, and then when we create the memory for that array, we've got to tell it the dimensions of each um, each dimension. And these two numbers don't have to be the same. And in our case, we wanted to have 7 days and 24 hours. And I'll use the first bracket to denote the day and the second bracket to denote the hour. Whenever I need to access an item in this two-dimensional array, then I just need to use the variable name and then square bracket the first index and then a square bracket with the second index. That same grid of values, here are the, the index um, of this variable A. A bracket 0 bracket 0 would be, say, Sunday at midnight, then Sunday at 1 a.m., Sunday at 2 a.m., and so on. If I want Monday, then I put a 1 in that first index position, and if I want midnight, then I put a 0. Simple enough. How do we read the data in? So recall when you create that array A, you're going to create that two-dimensional array and it's just going to initialize it with default values. In the case of a double variable, the default value is going to be 0.0. .0. I'm going to read in the data. So if I have some text file, I could read that in from the text file using standard in. And I'm going to have a nested loop. All right, the outer loop here is going to loop over the day, so over seven days. And then the inner loop is going to loop over the 24 hours of the day. Load each of those values into that particular element of the 2D array. And then I'm also doing a little extra calculation. I'm keeping track of the minimum temperature in the week and then the maximum temperature. We've not seen this, these two functions before math.min and math.max they do pretty much you know what you expect if you you basically give math.min two numbers and it returns the minimum if you give it um, math.max two numbers it returns the maximum and as this is kind of a, a, a neat way to do such a thing too notice how what I've done to set these variables min and max I've set the minimum to start out as the biggest number Okay, a double can hold, and I've set the maximum to be the smallest number the uh, double can hold. Actually, this probably should be uh, uh, not min value. It should be uh, negative, negative infinity, actually. Um, and this should probably be positive infinity. Uh, slight bug in the slides there. I'll have to fix that. But at any rate, this would find the minimum and the maximum because the first time it comes through the loop, if the minimum is like positive infinity, the the minimum 
of any other number and positive infinity is going to be that that number so you're going to work down from that from that big number and then the maximum is going to work upwards from negative infinity this is kind of a standard form so if you're not convinced of that you should you should uh, maybe make yourself a little program and, and try that out debugging I hate to break this to you but the majority of your time as a computer programmer is probably going to be spent trying to fix your program and not creating new programs when we talk about debugging we're talking about finding finding bugs or mistakes in your errors you've made in your program and you know, the word bugs is has a long history in engineering but here's actually a funny um you know i think this is in the smith smithsonian uh, museum there's actually at some point they had a really old computer with relays and the computer was malfunctioning because there was a moth in one of the relays and the the note in the journal says the first actual case of a of a bug being found it's important to understand that it's not your you know it's not just you it's not that you're stupid bugs happen to every programmer they happen to me they happen to the the best programmers in the world it is a difficult problem uh, programming and it's hard to keep track of everything in your head and you won't be able to do it you're going to make mistakes and you run your program and it is not going to do exactly what you want and so the question is how do you prevent that from happening or how do you uh, track down what's going wrong once once you're getting some incorrect output it would be really groovy if uh, the computer could just figure out where the problem is for you now things like the Eclipse IDE they're very good at pointing out some mistakes it can definitely spot some errors and just uh, point them out and in some cases even recommend a solution but it is not possible for a computer to automatically find all bugs it is uh, simply impossible um, and it all and debugging you know you're just gonna run into trouble because computers it's not the computer you know doing something crazy the computer is doing exactly what you told it to do all right but what you told it to do isn't exactly what you intended it to do all right it's not necessarily what you wanted but it is what you told it to do there is always 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 a logical explanation for the problem you won't necessarily believe this is true <laughs> trust me um, I've been there you know you think the computer is broken it's you know you know the hardware is faulty um, you know it's impossible and it always seems impossible until you understand uh, once you find the problem then you'll understand and go oh I see I understand what what went wrong but in the midst of debugging it will seem completely illogical and impossible but you have to believe you know and have faith that there is a logical explanation um, and an important uh, thing to remember if things are really seeming like I can't believe you know you know this is doing this I've made this you know big change and it's making absolutely it's having no effect if whatever you're doing is seeming to have no effect you should check your build pro process all right do you, are you sure you saved the file do you sure that the the program was compiled are you sure you're running the byte code of the program you just compiled all right you don't have two versions running around or something crazy like that um, this is a common thing that happens to people is uh, they're making changes the changes are having no effect and it's because somehow they're they're not running the right program or they're not compiling the program successfully and here's a couple quotes by um, some famous people um, lamenting you know the fact that basically if you're gonna program computers you're going to spend a lot of time debugging it's just it's just the nature of the beast first line of defense when it comes to debugging is try not to make bugs in the first place all right this is the ideal and here are a couple tips for how to do that first of all make a plan all right 
don't just don't just feel like you need to code immediately and start typing. Think things through a, a little bit beforehand. Uh, it may help to write out the steps. If you can explain it in English, you have a much higher chance of uh, converting that English description into something the computer can understand. If you don't understand yourself the process that needs to take place to get, get the problem solved, then you really have no chance of uh, codifying that process. So first of all, make sure you understand and could explain to, say, um, you know, another person the process you're going to use to solve the particular problem you're working on. As I mentioned in the, the lecture on style related issues, if you're getting to a tricky bit of code and you're not quite sure what code to write, it's a good time to stop and write a comment describing the tricky thing you're about to try and pull off. If you can comment the tricky bit in plain English, you stand a much better chance of actually implementing the code correctly. Don't skimp on your code style. You may think you're saving time by using really short variable names that aren't very descriptive or saying, oh, this variable was used for something else, but I changed how my program works, but I'm not going to go through and rename this variable. No, this is a very bad idea. Use Variables should be named for what they do. If you've got a variable named area, it should hold an area. If it holds the volume, all right, maybe it was holding an area and then you decided, oh, actually my program should be storing a volume instead. Rename the variable. If you leave it as area, you're going to forget and at some point you're going to make a mistake uh, because you'll forget, oh, actually my area var variable uh, actually contains a volume. Uh, always name your variables uh, appropriately and if you decide to change what a variable holds then go ahead and, and, and spend a little time renaming things. Don't try and do too much at once. Try and break things into manageable steps and ideally steps you can test one, one step at a time. If you're unsure about order of operations in say a math expression or a boolean, uh, boolean condition Go ahead and put some parentheses, parentheses around it and make sure you're getting the order of operations you intend. And another good tip is whenever you write the bounds on a loop, so that would be like what do you initialize the variable to and what's that condition of termination, think very carefully. Don't just guess. Try and think it through and try and get those bounds correct. It sometimes helps when you're trying to figure out the bounds to um, maybe write down or, or walk through a very small test case and make sure you've got the correct bounds. Listen to your, your uh, feedback from your in integrated development environment. Usually if Eclipse is upset about something, there there is a good reason for it. So assuming you haven't avoided bugs, uh, which you'll never completely do anyway, how do you find it? So your program is say compiling and running but it's not doing what you want. The first line of defense and a tried and true debugging method used by all programmers in every language is put in some debug print statements. You can put print statements in that just print out you know some you can put in some random text or whatnot uh, just so you can figure out where your program is running, what what loops are running, you know, are you actually getting into the, you know, into this if condition or you're in this else clause? What is your program executing? You can include, you know, things like the state of variables, uh, the looping, you know, the looping index values, and so on. You can just drop system.outprintlens, uh, sprinkle them throughout your code, and so you can understand the first, the first thing to do when you have a, a problem is trying to understand the problem. What is going on with your program? Where is it running? What order is it doing things in? Please remove these things before submission though. We don't want to run your program and see, you know, 10 pages of debug output. You can use the debugger in your IDE. So Eclipse, I've shown you uh, some examples of using the step debugger. Um, and so that works pretty good. It, in some of our assignments though, we'll be using 
uh, redirection, so reading our input from a file, and in those cases, um, you won't be able to use the integrated debugger. So then, using something like debug print statements is is your main main method for tracing tracing program execution. When it's not doing what you want, the best way to find the problem, and th this is what I do when I'm helping students in lab, if they're having a problem with their program, I don't look, you know. Sometimes I can look at the program and spot the problem, but I never point that out. What I do is I ask the student, you know, just tell me what your program's doing. And then they start talking about it and saying, you know, stepping through the code and pointing at things and telling me what it does. And I just nod and grin. And eventually they say, oh, you know, in, in their effort to explain it to me, they actually find the mistake themselves. I don't actually point out the mistake. I don't usually have to, or I might not even know where the mistake is, but in the act of explaining it to me, they, they find it themselves. Now, in this online course, of course, you don't have me in the lab to, to nod and grin at you and not actually, you know, point out your mistake. Uh, and So you might be able to use some other thing, like, you know, an inanimate object, like a a rubber ducky or here's a giant teddy bear somebody brought in the lab last year potted plant doesn't matter uh, uh, your your friend who's a programming novice if you can ex explain it to something you can usually uh, usually find the mistake it may feel silly but trust me it's actually a pretty effective technique so Let's debug a program. You may be thinking, well, I'm not going to make any mistakes, or how much trouble can I get into? I'm going to show you a example of a, a, a very short program that has a lot of mistakes. Here's the problem. You're computing the prime factorization of a big integer. Now, prime factorization is the list of prime numbers you multiply together to to get that number. So for example, 98 is 2 times 7 times 7. 17, the prime factorization of 17, well, 17 is already a prime number, so its prime factorization is just 17. And so on, and you can see even very big numbers. You might not have any idea what this is, you know, what what the prime factorization of, you know, whatever that is, 11 trillion, billion, whatever. Uh, but in fact, it's these two numbers multiplied together. Why do we care about prime factorization? Well, if you were really good at it, say you could f find the prime factorization of very large numbers, say 200 digit numbers, and you could do it really quickly, well, then you've broken all of internet security. All of um, things like the SSL feature of your web browser relies on the factorization of large numbers being hard. Here's a simple algorithm that can compute the, front, the, the prime factorization of a number. The algorithm starts by setting a counter variable equal to 2. It has some number n, and it's going to repeatedly divide n by i as long as it evenly divides. So if n starts off to be an even number, then of course it is going to divide by 2 at least once, and maybe it will divide by 2 more than once. It keeps doing that until that number i no longer divides into the remaining uh, value for n and at that point it increments i and then it just repeats this increasing i every time. Here's an example run of the program. We're computing the prime factorization of 16,562. We start with our i counter at 2. This is an even number of course and so 2 will divide into that number leaving 8 8,281. 3 does not divide into that number, neither does 4 or 5 or 6. So every time it doesn't divide, it increments by 1. It gets to 7, and it turns out 7 does divide into 8,281. And after doing that division, it also divides a further time. So we have 2 times 7 times 7, leaving us with 169. And 8 doesn't go into 169, 9 doesn't go into 169, 10 doesn't go in, 11 doesn't go in, 12 doesn't go in, but 13 does. And in fact, 13 times 13 is 169. And at this point, everything else just returns 
turns 1. All right, we're left with just 1, and so 14 obviously doesn't divide into 1. And the prime factorization of the number is thus 2 times 7 times 7 times 13 times 13. Here is my first attempt at doing this factorization. We parse the first command line argument. We put it into a long variable just so we can have very large numbers. Then I have my for loop. It loops from 0 to i is strictly less than n. Does the division, so remember the percent sign is the modulo operator. It divides n by i and returns the remainder. So if the remainder is 0, that means it evenly divided. If it did evenly divide, then go ahead and print out that number and then divide n by that number i and then keep doing that as long as that works. If you want to test your, your skills, I suggest you pause the video at this point and put this program into Eclipse and see if you can get it functioning correctly. If you put this into Eclipse, you'll first discover that there are a bunch of syntax errors. All right, and I fixed the program here, and what did I change? I added the semicolons and the integer. And syntax errors tend to be quite easy to sort out. I can pull up my, here's my, I've called mine factors zero just because I have a bunch of different versions. Syntax errors are usually not where you're going to spend a lot of time debugging because actually yeah, Eclipse knows this is a problem. It knows it needs a semicolon there and it needs a semicolon there and a semicolon there. And the other gripe is this variable i. You're not allowed to use a variable without declaring its type. And now I have to declare that variable i and then everything is, is fine with my program. Syntax errors tend to be easy to find and fix. Once I've corrected those programs, all right, I go ahead and run my, and it now compiles, and I can try and run it, and I run it with the number 98, and it crashes. It has a or arithmetic exception, divide by zero. What's the problem with this? Well, look at where this, if you trace this loop, right, it's going to start at i equals 0. And the first thing it's going to do, oh, I don't even see a, you know, where's the division? Why is it on line 8? Well, n percent 0 has to compute the division and see what the remainder is. And you can't divide by 0, so it crashes. The mistake here is we didn't intend this to start. If you recall the algorithm description, it was supposed to start at i equals 2, and I started it at 0. My loop bound was incorrect. Now I run it for 98, and hooray, it works, except it just prints out 2, and prints out 2 forever. I've already shown you the mistake here. Indentation does not imply a, a code block. Remember that Java ignores spaces and tabs and so on. Um, you know, th whether you indent or not, it doesn't influence the, the, the semantics of the code. We can fix that. We can put in some curly braces. Now we run it. Java factors 98. All right, looking a little better, 277. So that's right, except it doesn't go down a line. We need a new line after, after this input. If I run it for 5, well, it's a prime factorization of 5. Well, it should just print out 5. 6 should print out 2 times 3. We get no input for 5, and for 6, we're missing the the final three. Not quite sure what's wrong. If you're not quite sure what's wrong, then a good thing to do is to put in some debug trace statements. What I've done here is I've just changed this print to be a println just so this appears on a line by itself so it's less confusing uh, just for for this debugging run. Then I put after the while loop a little trace. And I just invented you know whatever word just so I, I know that this particular println is the one responsible for the output. And I'm going to print out the value of i and then the value of n because I don't really know what's going on. Here's the output for factors 5. So remember, factors 5 didn't return anything. 
we only see the trace lines in factors five output. Factor six, we get one of the we get two, so that's this print line here printing out. Then we get the one trace statement. Well, what's the problem? Well, I was supposed to go up to n, but I never made it. We went 2, 3, 4. n is 5. I never got to 5. I went 2, n was 3. I never got there, so I'm off by 1 in my loop. Like I said, loops are a big source of bugs, so be very careful you start and stop them on the right index values. So, is this a correct program? Run it for factors 5, that works. 6, 2 times 3, 98, 2 times 7 times 7. Run it for a bigger number. Looking good. But if we run it for larger and larger numbers, it starts taking longer and longer to run. It's producing the correct output, but it's taking, oh, except for this one, what's going on here? This is a very big number. It prints out the first factor, and then it just prints out negative one forever. So what the heck's going on there? This has something to do with the size of the data type, right? The long n can store a very big integer, but we're using an int variable in this for loop. And that integer variable can't store as big of an integer as the long. And so eventually the, the, the integer i kind of gets broken because it gets too big. But it's also too slow. It turns out you can make a faster version by dividing this by i. All right. And by dividing by i, essentially, you never need to divide by more than the square root of, you can't, no, no sense in going bigger than the square root of n is the basic story why you divide by i. But when you add this in there, you go ahead, it now runs faster, but factors 98, that returns the correct output, but these other guys are now missing their last factor. And this is a, a good lesson in uh, being careful when you optimize. So first of all, don't try and make your code fast right away. Make your program correct first and then make it fast second and normally you don't have to do the second step. But be careful when you take optimizations like this that you haven't broken something. And in this case we have. And finally to make a fast version that also is correct we have to handle this special corner case when um, the biggest factor only occurs once. And now we can run, for very large numbers, we can run, run this program quite quickly. How big of a number can I factor? Well, I could pull it up in my, you know, we could run these live. Here's, the, um, here's my terminal window. And I think my final version is a file called factor 7. I can run 757208. That was reasonably quick. Uh, that's a big number. I'm gonna have to paste though. Oops. Guess I can't paste. Guess I'm just gonna have to type it out. All right, we'll put it down there. Nine two zero one 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 six nine seven five 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 seven zero three. Oops. I think I mistyped it. What did I mistype? I got one too many fives, huh? It's faster, but it's not super fast. <laughs> All right, you can still give it a a a number that takes quite a long time to factor. We can just put that over to the side now. We'll see if it finishes before the end of the lecture. Here's a table of results for both the, yeah, see, that wasn't too bad. Here's a table of results for the original version, the unoptimized for loop that was going until i is strictly less than or equal to n. 
here's the new and improved faster version and how long it takes for different size numbers and you can see actually we can go up to you know 18 digits now in, in 92 seconds but notice this is a bit amazing right the difference a good algorithm makes a little improved you know, just dividing this thing by i we go from 2.4 millennium to 90 92 seconds and we'll talk more about uh, algorithms and such performance issues later in the course final thing I want to say about debugging when you're working on bigger programs say some of your programming assignments try and split your development up into stages don't try and go for the gold and implement the whole program at once try and come up with a logical s sequence do each bit uh, in a stage and after each stage test it thoroughly make sure for example your program is reading all your input correctly before you go on to using that input and and so on it works a lot better because you can find the bugs in isolation and you're less likely to have sort of interaction effects if you make multiple bugs in different parts of your program it can become quite difficult to try and track down what the cause of the problem is. So to summarize, we reviewed that variables, they live within the curly braces. If they're declared inside a curly brace block, they only live inside of there. And they can be redeclared, but only after they've gone out of scope. We reviewed arrays, things that hold a collection of variables of the same type. You use integer indexes, an integer variable inside of brackets to uh, programmatically access these elements in the array. We saw a bit about how to create two-dimensional arrays. And then we talked a lot about debugging, having a plan, using good style to try and prevent bugs. And then once something does go wrong, and it will go wrong, how you can use debug statements to try and print out what's going wrong. Uh, use the debugger or um, other ways as well as uh, tell it to the teddy bear, tell it to the, the rubber ducky, uh, talk your way through your program and often you can find your mistake that way.